You know, uh, Mark is absolutely right. This is a, a wonderful chapter full of praise and worship, and it would be, it would find a wonderful place within the Psalms if it was there. Uh, but God, in his wisdom, has chosen to bring it to us from Isaiah chapter 12. So let's read a chapter 12 together. In that day you will say, I will praise you, Lord, although you were angry with me. Your anger has turned away, and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself, is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day you will say, Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done, and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. See, this is a prophetic hymn of praise about the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ across all the earth. And we'll look at the particular key verse in this passage uh, in a moment. But what I want you to think about, I want you to think about these two kingdoms that we're going to be looking at. And think about just where you stand in relation to these kingdoms. Because there's certainly choices to be made. You can find yourself someone who says they belong to the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, but ultimately their, their life doesn't match it. Their life really just doesn't match what they say. Or you can find yourself feeling trapped by your own sin in the world but not knowing and understanding that you don't have to remain there. That there is a way to escape your own sin. That God has made a way. In verse 2, it says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Let's think about where this book started. In the Bible, an argument can, can be made, and an argument can be made for our nations today, that a leader, a king, is representative of the people. You see, when the king is faithful to God, it is an indicator that it's during a time when the people are faithful to God. And likewise, if there is an idolatrous apostate king, then that would usually be showing the spiritual position of the nation. Now what that says about us today, I'll leave to you. But I think you'll find it hard to find a country on earth that is close to God at this point. Now let's remind ourselves of the state of the Israelite people in the time of Isaiah. During the time of the divided kingdom in Israel, there was a string of wicked kings who ruled in the northern and southern kingdoms. This should not be surprising. When the people of Israel first became dissatisfied with God as their king and clamored for an earthly king, God warned them that human kings would make them unhappy. Let's think that through for a moment. Here is God's people who had been taken out of slavery, out of the bondage. They'd been ransomed by their God. And here they are asking for a human king. I mean, that should tell us the position of the human heart to begin with. But God, again, warned them that human kings would make them unhappy. We see that in 1 Samuel. But the people insisted. And so God gave them over to their desires. You see, when God wants to allow judgment of our sin... He very usually just lets us go. It's fair. 
There's very few punishments that can be brought for our sin that is worse than just letting us live in it. Live in the muck that we've seen. Not just dipping your toe into it, but completely immersing yourself in it. That it is your heart's desire to live in the world. That you would forsake having God as your king just for one more time, one more moment in the world. While there were several righteous kings who ruled over God's people in Judah, the number of poor rulers who led the people into idolatry would eventually bring the nation to ruin. And then the captivity in a foreign land. You see, God brought his people out of Egypt, out of bondage, out of captivity. He blessed them and kept them. And they rejected them. And they chose to go into captivity. God may have allowed it and ordained it to happen. But it wasn't outside the choice of God's people. By their sin, they chose to be separated from God. Let's have a look at the the kings mentioned in Isaiah. Ahaz, the king of Judah, the southern kingdom. You see, Ahaz was an evil king of Judah who became king at the age of 20. And he reigned for four years with his father Jotham from 735 to 731 BC and 16 years on his own from 731 to 715 BC. We see in 2 Kings 16 and 2 Chronicles 28 that record King Ahaz's destructive practices, such as idol worship and sacrilege against the temple of the Lord. The actions of Ahaz contributed to the downfall of the kingdom of Judah, which the Lord brought in 586 BC. Isaiah 7 to 10 speaks of the results and consequences of King Ahaz's wicked ways. Ahaz's sacrilege and sin did not end there. To impress the king of Assyria, he removed the royal entryway of the temple, as well as the Sabbath canopy, and cut the temple furnishings into pieces. To impress a foreign pagan king, he desecrated the temple of the Lord. The scriptures call the church a temple of the Lord our God. A temple of the Holy Spirit. How many churches do we see trying to impress the world by desecrating the temple of God? See, we we look back and we think this is something that happened then, years ago, centuries ago, in a foreign land, in a foreign culture, talking about pagan kings and and ancient empires. But the same thing happens today. And the truth is, it's us that do it. We take that which is holy, and we tear it down piece by piece until it's palatable to the world. After shutting the doors to the temple, he placed altars at all the street corners in Jerusalem and high places for worshipping false gods in every city in Judah. Now the Bible isn't clear on how Ahaz died, but it certainly tells us how he lived. And it does say that although he was buried with his ancestors in Jerusalem, he did not earn a place in the tombs of the kings of Israel. His son Hezekiah reigned after him and fortunately, or blessed Israel was, that King Hezekiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. See, just as it's easy in one generation to go from following God to become an apostate and go on your own way, God can bring us back in a single generation as well. He reversed what his father had done to the temple, purifying it and again consecrating it for the worship of the Lord. 
Then we have the other king that is mentioned in Isaiah. Pekah was an evil king who began his rule in the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom. And he began that rule by assassinating the former king for whom Pekah served as a chief officer and taking over his throne. You see, Pekah reigned for 20 years before he himself was assassinated. Before Pekah was killed, however, some events took place that had a big impact on the nation of Israel and also on the whole world. Late in his reign, Pekah entered an alliance with the king of Syria. That's what we've just been looking at these past weeks. And attacked the southern kingdom of Judah. Besieging Jerusalem. In response, King Ahaz of Judah sought help from the Assyrians. And Assyria invaded and took Ejon, Abel, Beth, Maka, Jonah, Kadesh, and Hazor. He took Gilead and Galilee including all the land of Naphtali, and deported the people to Assyria. You see, this was the beginning of the destruction of the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom, which was God's judgment for the sin and the idolatry of the kings and their people. See, it's quite easy to blame the leaders and absolve ourselves of any responsibility. But usually, our leaders are emblematic of the people that they rule. Pekah's assassin, Hoshea, would reign for nine years after his death. But King Shalmanassar of Assyria would discover Hoshea's treachery and refusing to pay tribute. And attempting to ally with Egypt against Assyria. Do you see how all these alliances between all the pagan nations. Do you see how those who should be God's people, instead of allying themselves with God and taking God's offer of him being their savior, they were looking everywhere else. I wonder if that's you today. I wonder if you're sitting here and you're looking for a friend. You're looking for help, but you're looking in all the wrong places. I wonder if you think that God is too holy and my sin is too great. I wonder if you're so despairing and despondent that even the thought of taking yourself to God it just, it doesn't even cross your mind. And I'm speaking to believers. We can be saved and find ourselves in a spiritual wilderness. Find ourselves really hurting and suffering and far for the Lord and thinking to ourselves, I just don't know how to get back. And then we start looking in all the wrong places. We start looking to the world. We start looking everywhere else but the place that will reconcile us and rescue us. And that is God himself. The kings of the northern kingdom attempting to ally with Egypt against Assyria and in prison Hoshea. Another major event that happened during Pekah's rule that brought to God's people, brought hope to God's people, when King Pekah and King Rezin of Aram marched against Ahaz, king of Judah. The Lord sent the prophet Isaiah to comfort Ahaz and the people. Think about that for a second. Think about what God is doing. God is seeing his people reject him. God is seeing his people reject And one of his kings, look elsewhere. And God's response is to send a prophet. God's response is to be the proactive agent. He's the one that saves. He's the one that comes. He's the one that sends. He's the one that brings hope. And what did they say? 
Isaiah, when he came to Ahaz. He said, it will not take place. It won't happen. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is only resin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people, the northern kingdom. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is only Ramaliah's son. Who is the head of God's people? But God himself. But the head of these people were men. And then, in Isaiah 7, 79, the most important verse in that passage is, if you do not stand in your faith, firm in your faith, then you won't stand at all. Don't think there's another way out. If you don't stand firm in your faith, even when facing such odds, then you won't stand at all. This is a prophetic word of God. He is telling this king and this people, even though all these nations are far bigger than you, who are taking town and city after city, marching towards you, when they come to your little Jerusalem, they won't take it. Why? Because that's God's city. And God won't let it fall at this point. The Lord also offered Ahaz a sign. And even though Ahaz refused on the grounds that he did not want to test the Lord, which instead of showing faith was actually a lack of faith, God moved Isaiah to give this famous prophecy. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. Not only did God promise that king, Pekin, King Rezin, would not prevail, but he also spoke about how his son, Jesus the Messiah, Israel had long awaited, would come. Ahaz saw the sign of a child's birth, but the ultimate fulfillment of the prophecy awaited the birth of Jesus Christ, who was born to a virgin, grew up, died on a cross, and rose again, all to save his people from the reign of sin and death. You, you may be sitting here and you're asking yourself, what, how, how can I get back to God? How is my, what is the way out of my situation? How can I be free of my sin and the penalty of my sin? Well, it's the same message that the kids received. It's only through Jesus. There's going to be a lot of people come to judgment who will come to God and say, I read my Bible. I prayed. I worked in ministry. I was pastor of a church. I was an elder of a church. I served in a church for 50 years. And Jesus will turn and say, I, I never knew you. Because you don't need to do all that to get salvation. That proves, that's kind of service may prove your salvation. But it's not how you earn your salvation. You can't earn it. Once the water's muddied, there is no way we can clean it. But by the precious blood of Christ. But by you putting your trust in Jesus and him alone. Isaiah 12, chapter 2 is a key verse. Because it shows a remarkable change. Remember, this is a prophetic chapter looking way ahead to a, to a different time. We've seen what the kings were like in Isaiah's time. We've seen what like, the people were like in Isaiah's time. We see that king, we see that kingdom, we see that people. Now we get a look at a greater time, a better time. A time when 
after seeing God offer help and salvation to Ahaz. A time when he was commanded to trust and have faith and don't be afraid. We see a prayer of praise from someone who has been through the judgment of God. This, this is the heart of someone who has been through and is the, realm, the remnant. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. You see, unlike Ahaz in chapter 7, who when commanded by the Lord to trust him and not be afraid and to not seek alliances with the Lord's enemies to make him strong, but to rather let the Lord God be his strength, we see what it will look like in that day. This is a future time even for us. The contrast of the reign of Ahaz compared with that of the reign of Messiah in chapter 11 is night and day. Do you read chapter 11 and chapter 12 and get excited by it? Have you read it and thought, this is my future? God is revealing a promised future to me. I know what kind of world I'm going to live in. I know under what kind of king I'm going to live and serve. The difference between Ahaz and the Messiah is night and day. This chapter is a prophetic hymn of praise from under the global reign of Messiah Jesus. We see the heartfelt worship of someone enjoying the benefits of the reign of God's perfect king. In that day, well, what day? When the Messiah of the Jews and Gentiles, Jesus Christ's kingdom and reign extends not between a river and a sea, but across the whole earth. Chapter 11. When all the enemies of God have been brought low and a global transformation has occurred, the language used in chapter 11 is of a global flood. Just as the water covers the, the sea, so shall the, the extension of the kingdom of God be. Can you imagine that? A global peace under the God's perfect king. And you here today, if you've trusted in Jesus, you can stand here and more importantly, stand out there and say you're a part of that kingdom. You're a part of that kingdom to come. And you're a part of that kingdom today. In a world of sin and death and pain and suffering, you belong to a different kingdom and a different king. You can stand here and you can say these words in chapter 12 for yourself. Not reading them and what somebody else has said, but read them and pray them and sing them and proclaim them for yourself because it's a reality in your life. We see the heartfelt worship of someone enjoying the benefits of the reign of God's perfect king. You see, unlike in Isaiah's time when this bad king Ahaz, that, has, uh, that is representative of the people, the people who live under God's perfect king will be different. They will be mar marked by the characteristics of this new and eternal king Jesus. Let's have a look at Galatians chapter 5. And you get to see a comparison between two different kinds of people. Those who are uh, fleshly, completely fleshly, who, are, who, who have no spirit, who rely solely on the flesh. 
The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and the envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul is speaking to Christians and listing them. People who profess faith in Christ, who are part of the church in Galatia. And Paul is listing these sins and saying, those of you that are involved in this and are not repentant, they don't see anything wrong with it, they're continuing in it, you are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Not that you've lost your salvation, but you were never really saved to begin with. And then we see Paul highlight what it looks like for somebody who lives under King Jesus. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh, the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. What list characterizes you here today? Where do you stand? Is the manifestation of the character of God in you, is that who you're shown that you belong to King Jesus? Or do you belong to a different king? You see, the change we see evidenced in Isaiah 12 and in verse 2 in particular is as miraculous a change as we see evidenced in Galatians 5. A human being by themselves cannot go from one to the other. You cannot leave that life of sin and death and move to righteousness and life on your own. You need someone else to get you there. You need to be part of that global transformation. So which king's characteristics mark you? For those that come through the judgment of God, those people are the remnant. And you and I are not in that group unless God's judgment declares us to be in that remnant. We should be thankful for the judgment of God in our lives. You see, God's judgment isn't something that happens to other people. It happens to everybody. But unlike those outside of Christ, who remain outside of Christ, we don't receive condemnation. But how do we know something is right in our lives? How do we know that we are living rightly? before God it's when we allow God to judge that part of our lives when we come through the judgment and we are still part of the remnant of God then that is a declaration of God about who we are and who we belong to the question becomes, will we make it through the fires of judgment? Or will we be weighed and measured and found lacking? You see, you here today must make sure to which king you belong to. You belong to the worldly kingdom of darkness under the wickedness of men like Ahaz, leaders whose allegiance is to Satan. Or do you belong to Christ, your king, the perfect king, the image of the invisible God. And as Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says, we'll bring that up for you as well. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. 
sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. King Jesus is the exact representation of his being, of God. How close are you to being a representation of him? And can you honestly and wholeheartedly stand up here today and say these words for yourself? In that day you will say, I will praise you, Lord, although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day, you will say, give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. You know, that call in verse four there is for us today as well. That's a gospel proclamation. Go and tell people. He continues in verse five, sing to the Lord for he has done glorious things. Let this be made known, be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. This is something that Israel is going to do as well. Those who will be the remnant who will turn to the Lord and live under Messiah King, Jesus. But we already live under Messiah King, Jesus. How many people have you shared the gospel of the Lord Jesus with this week? How many people have heard from your lips give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done for you and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord for he has done glorious things. How many times this week have you done that? You have a place in the kingdom of God, but you have an obligation and responsibility to live in it. Otherwise, you may prove yourself as someone who does not truly belong to that king. So I pray that today the hymn, the, prof the prophesied hymn, hymn that we've been looking at is a reality in your life, that it's in your heart, that you're rejoicing in the Lord today, that you can proclaim his name among the nations because of what he has done for you. Because he has done a remarkable, miraculous, wonderful thing. He has taken a people who were dead in their sin and, tre and trespasses and has made them alive. You are a resurrected people. I guarantee you if somebody in the hospital miraculous, miraculous was raised from the dead, you would see it in the news. Here we have a room full of people miraculously raised from the dead. Why are we being silent about it? Go and tell the nations. I was dead, now am I alive. Praise be to God and their Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your Son, the Lord Jesus, our King, our Savior, our Lord, and our God. Lord, we, we live lives that at times don't honor you, but you are faithful when we are not. And Lord, you offer us the opportunity of repentance that we can come daily before you, not for a, for a full bath to be saved and cleansed, but for just for that foot washing. Because what Jesus done on that day will be effectual now and forevermore and in that day. So Lord, thank you. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for my brothers and sisters here today who belong to you, who are born again, who seek to follow you and live a life that honors you. Lord, keep us, keep us from sinning. Keep us from the evil one. Protect your people. 
Let us not seek to make alliances with the world and your enemies, but rely solely upon the strength and power of our God. In Jesus' name, amen.